Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back with you today for our final panel of the day, Policy Levers and Institutions. We've had an incredible discussion today in which many of the panels touched upon these questions of what policies do we take forward? How do we reform institutions? This afternoon, we have a fantastic panel of experts coming from the public sector, the private sector, academia, with perspectives on many of the topics that we've discussed today. Our hope is that we can synthesize some of the ideas as well as talk about not just the what, but the how. So let me introduce our, our panelists. We've got uh, Congressman Lisa Blunt Rochester, who is representative uh, at large for Delaware. She also is a co-chair of her own task force on the work of the future, uh, I should call it the future of work, uh, which is the new democratic coalition in Congress. Uh, she's also a former secretary of labor for uh, Delaware. Following Representative Blunt Rochester is Karen Mills, who's a senior fellow at the Harvard Business School, as well as the former head of the Small Business Administration between 2009 and 2013 under the Obama administration. We also have joining us Jeff Wilkie, CEO of Amazon's worldwide consumer uh, division, uh, who will be uh, there again, at least until the beginning of, of, the, of next year. And finally, Professor John Van Rienen, who joins us from London. He's the Ronald Coase Chair in Economics and School Professor at LSE, also a member of the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future uh, while he was at MIT, certainly still a member today. So thank you all of us, uh, all of you for joining us uh, for today and we're looking forward to a great conversation. I'm gonna start with a topic I think that didn't necessarily receive as much discussion today as some of the other um, areas of, of uh, research and recommendation that we make in our final report. As, as I mentioned earlier on, we talk about three pillars of action, one around improving job quality, another around innovating in skills and training, and the third around expanding and shaping innovation, uh, an important piece of how we actually grow the next generation of, of jobs. And I'd like to begin perhaps with uh, John, with you, an expert in innovation and understanding how uh, innovation occurs. And maybe you can give us a, an overview of what you think um, the key components to a growth and innovation agenda should be. And what have we learned uh, from your research and elsewhere about how we can make innovation actually uh, benefit a broader uh, swath of society and, and generate broader shared prosperity? Sure. So, so uh, thanks very much, Liz, and uh, delighted to be here and share share some thoughts. Uh, so, you know, as as you know, we said, I think in the uh, in the in the report, you know, there's two key problems as I see it, which uh, you know we we kind of face in America. I mean, one is the the problem of um, low productivity growth. There was a slowdown in the rate of productivity growth after the mid 70s and that's you know, even slowed down even further after the global financial crisis of course we're having a massive slowdown now and that's a problem because if the kind of economic pie is growing more slowly then it's harder to get sustainable kind of wage growth if that's not happening and then the twin problem that we have of course is that the fruits from that economic growth that pie is not being shared fairly uh, across across the whole of uh, society, especially to less educated workers. So, you know, to tackle that, what you know, one of the the, the the kind of key things we need to do is to kind of return back to sustainable and equitable productivity growth, which can then feed through to kind of wage growth. So, how do we do that? Well, there's lots of things that we have to do. We've discussed many of them today. But uh, for me, uh, what is really important is innovation. I mean, in the long run. Really, um, for a, a country like America, which is you know at the technological frontier of so many sectors, we really have to you know, you know reclaim that the, the claim the mantle of having faster innovation and pushing the technological frontier forward. So how how do we do that? Well, there's lots of different things that you know you can think about doing. I personally think that you know uh, there's a suite of uh, policies around innovation that we need to do. I, I put forward a, a proposal for the, in the Hamilton. Um, Hamilton Foundation recently uh, arguing for um, a grand innovation challenge, $100 billion a year uh, through a series of different projects to deal with some of the missions that we have to, uh, the missions we face around health, around the environment, around defense. And you know, we looked at a lot of different innovation policies there. We need a mix between tax policies and direct subsidies. We should think about supply side policies in order to um, help reinvigorate um, our universities to have skilled immigration. One thing I'm very passionate about is that 
we should think about in the long run what Raz Chatty and I sometimes call the lost Einstein or lost Marie Curie effect, which is that in America, there are many uh, talented people who could have become inventors, could have become innovators or entrepreneurs, but are denied the opportunity because they happen to be born to a low-income family or they happen to be uh, born to be a minority or they uh, women are often, not, you know, potential inventors who aren't given the opportunity. So I think that there are a lot of um, barriers to those kind of groups we could try to lift through better in, uh, education policies, through policies to encourage um, minority and low-income kids to go to universities to study STEM. Um, and that would do two things. One, it would um, be good for equity. It would be good to kind of, you know, uh, help people from disadvantaged groups. But secondly, it would be good for growth because we're losing out on a lot of potential talented people by squandering some of their talents. And that would be a set of policies which could both help growth and also help equity. So that's just one of the examples. I'm sure we can talk about many more. Thank you, John. Yeah, maybe I'll turn to Karen now, who's done a lot of investing in small business, uh, in gazelles. What's your thought about the innovation agenda ahead? Well, there's a surprising source of innovation in this country. Usually we talk about manufacturing as the source of innovation, and I know Jeff has a lot of things to say about it, but I want to focus on a different piece um, that we sort of discovered this hidden gem, which is um, the service economy, but not the service economy of the mom and pop restaurant. This is the B2B supply chain service economy. And we just did some work, Mercedes Delgado, who used to be at MIT uh, and is now in Copenhagen Business School. We just discovered, um, you know, how much of the U.S. economy's innovation ecosystem is driven by these companies that are producing the next general purpose technology. So you think about cloud computing, the general purpose technology that was so great, you know, in the past uh, was the semiconductor and that was a manufactured item. But the next ones, which are AI and machine learning after cloud computing are really driven by um, service providers. So how do we think about our B2B service economy, which has big businesses like Salesforce and uh, Microsoft and um, also small innovative companies, um, which are funded by venture capital and are gazelles and high growth. How do we think about driving that piece of our innovation economy and not just say, well, let's bring manufacturing back. And this involves a whole integrated strategy around driving the science and the innovation and driving the skilled workforce that we're gonna need for this group. Thank you, Karen. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective. I don't think we talk a lot about the B2B uh, world. I'm sure Jeff has a lot of thoughts about that, <laughs> works deeply in that. What's your thought, Jeff? I mean, you have a perspective uh, for over many years now of watching one of the largest companies in America grow and innovate. What's your thought about the innovation agenda for the country and how it, we can generate greater shared prosperity? Well, I, first of all, Liz, th thanks for including me. I, I just want to build on the uh, data that Karen uh, shared. You know, uh, Amazon's been working to support small businesses for uh, a couple of decades now. And the way we've done it is by introducing tools that help lower the startup costs uh, to make a small business successful. And it allows smaller businesses to be uh, way more competitive than they would have been in an age where they had to put all of the money that they raised into silicon as um, as Karen described, and now they can spend their time on innovation that can be leveraged in the cloud. We've invested tens of billions of dollars in infrastructure. So in the hardware and silicon that, uh, that again, small businesses used to have to, to procure themselves and built hundreds of tools that enable companies to build new companies, to build new products. Um, in our retail part of our business, it allows independent sellers to succeed selling in our store. And some of these tools include our fulfillment by Amazon products. So in a B2B sense, we allow very small sellers and brand owners to not have to worry about fulfillment and logistics infrastructure. And we sort of provide that to them on a variable basis. I mentioned AWS, we have a bunch of other seller services that handle things from marketing to catalog services and so on. So there is this really vibrant 
um, uh, development that's occurred over the last couple of decades that is providing these tools for innovation and entrepreneurialism uh, in the U.S. And Congresswoman, uh, you're sitting, you know, from a perspective of the federal government and thinking about growth and innovation. I know that's been part of the, sort of a uh, part of a dual agenda that you've been leading. What's your thought about that? What that looks like, and from a policy point of view, going forward. Well, first of all, Liz, thank you and MIT for this conversation. It, it's very exciting and it's really hard for me because as I'm listening to each of the speakers, there's something that I want to say. Um, even going back to the conversation about, you know, the B2B potential and explosion and opportunities, um, I really came into Congress about four years ago uh, in freshman term and I started hearing all of these conversations. I was on the in the labor committee as well as on agriculture because Delaware is a big agriculture state. And no matter where I went, there were conversations about the future of work, about skills, about autonomous vehicles and the displacement of people and the disruption and this real fear. And um, even in doing research, found out that there were individuals who would be further left behind if we were not intentional. And so part of it for me was to, to think about how do we as a country have a North Star and think about this from a perspective of people's lives and well-being, but also from a competitive standpoint as a country. And so for me, the conversation is very important. And what, what I focused on was creating a bipartisan future work caucus in the Congress. I'm a part of the New Dems Task Force on Future of Work. I'm part of the Progressive Caucus's new uh, Future of Work. But I felt that as a country, this is an area that we can get around because it impacts every single one of us and we don't wanna leave anybody behind. And as I heard all of these conversations, one of the big issues that came up in my mind was access to broadband and internet. Because in order to do the things that we're talking about, People need that access. And so for me, this conversation, I could go in many different directions, but I think the potential is there if we unite business, nonprofit, government, and each do our part, play our role. And so I'm excited to be a part of the conversation um, and look forward to, to further questions where we can get into some details. May I ask, Congresswoman, because you really have been a pioneer. Did you find any resistance to setting up some of these caucuses? I mean, did you, what was the, the climate in the last couple of years to think about this topic? Well, it's interesting because we launched the caucus right before COVID-19 struck. And we literally had standing room only. Democrats, Republicans, we had the, the Council of Black Mayors, we had um, the unions, AFL-CIO, we had, uh, you know, just these the diverse, Academic, academics, uh, folks came, I had your, held up your report at the, at, the, uh, at the thing. And so there was this common agreement that we need to have the conversation where the challenge comes in is the how. And as we know, that's usually where the devil, you know, the devil's in the details of the how. For example, the issue of a social contract for our country, we have not revisited that, you know, in, in decades. And what COVID did was push artificial intelligence. It pushed distance learning. Telehealth is at record levels, uh, distance to telework. And so it made us as a Congress have to come together. And so the resistance hasn't, hasn't started yet because we're still in the midst of something that is pushing us to work together. That's a really interesting um, perspective because um, Jeff, I mean, I think you would, from an Amazon point of view, who have both been pushed and a leader, I think, in responding to these concerns about technology, right? There's been some challenges to where uh, Amazon is one of our largest employer, you know, what's going on for low-wage workers. At the same time, you've been responding, and in, in many ways, we've talked about shaping that technology and shaping work going forward and finding ways to help, help workers um, make this transition. Can you talk a, a little bit about your Amazon uh, journey on this topic? Sure. Well, um, uh, some of the things that we're doing are about investing in employees. And, um, you, you know, we, we employ uh, nearly a, a million people now. 
Um, we've made a commitment of over $700 million over the next few years to upskill training for at least 100,000 of those U.S. employees. And the idea is to help them to move from low-skilled, entry-level jobs into uh, high-demand uh, and higher-paying jobs. Um, so some of the jobs they'll take will be at Amazon, and, and you know we have jobs in our corporate offices, we have tech hubs, we have fulfillment centers, we've got retail stores, we've got a transportation network, but we also want to make sure that we can prepare employees for work outside of Amazon. Um, so you can imagine a, a, a world where a, uh, an employee comes to Amazon with very little skills, and they make $15 an hour. By the way, we're, we're a huge fan of $15 minimum wage. We went there a couple of years ago. It was nice to see uh, companies like uh, Target and Best Buy follow. Uh, we, we'd like to see uh, all companies in the U.S. Uh, follow and get to a $15 minimum wage. But it can't stop at $15. We, we have to build, you know, together with government, we have to build programs that improve the skills that our lowest paid workers have so that they can build, they can create career options for themselves. That's the way I like to think about it. So we've built this upskilling program called Career Choice, which pays 95% of tuition for anyone who's a, an employee in our fulfillment uh, and transportation networks um, to study in demand fields, regardless of whether those fields uh, and uh, study would be useful at Amazon. The, the important criteria is whether those, uh, whether that work that they would do would yield them better career options. And the graduates have gotten into things like game design and, vis and visual communications to nursing. They've gotten into programming uh, and radiology. And uh, we're gonna continue to aggressively support this program because it's been so helpful to the, you know, to the employees who start at the bottom of the, uh, the, the rung on the, the labor ladder. Um, there's one, one other thing I would mention, which is we, we also think that uh, we can start earlier than just people who are entering the workforce, maybe after high school or after some, some technical education. And that is going back to, uh, to uh, pre-high school and high school, starting with computer science. So I'd love to see us uh, as a nation commit to having at least one qualified computer science teacher in every public high school. Over half the high schools in the country do not have such a teacher. Amazon's trying to do its part by increasing access to computer science education, going all the way back to kindergarten through 12th grade. We've got 550,000 students in more than 5,000 schools in the US that are, are using curriculum that we support. Um, many of them are in uh, underserved communities. We're actually, uh, we're sponsoring 100 full scholarships. Uh, they're $40,000 college scholarships each year to students uh, from underserved communities that are, that are pursuing computer science degrees. And those students have a paid internship at Amazon when they come out. So I think there's a lot that we can do in industry to create career paths that start with a fair minimum wage for low-skilled jobs and allow workers to create options for themselves to, to move up. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the um, the minimum wage and the fact that I think everybody probably paid attention that Florida just passed by 60 percent uh, an increase in their minimum wage. You know, very uh, interesting um, kind of bipartisan support for that, I guess. But the reality is, as I spoke earlier uh, today, is that low wage workers in the U.S. are really some of the worst paid. Of among rich countries. They're in a, a very tough position. We, as I said earlier, Canadian workers in the same position make a third more. They also have access to health care. I mean, how do we move beyond, I guess, the minimum wage into other areas that are going to improve job quality? And um, maybe uh, Representative Blunt Rochester, your, your thoughts about some of the other areas we need to be focused on? Well, you know, as you talked about those individuals, many of them are also the ones that are on the front lines during this pandemic, many of those job, job holders. And so, you know, I think the, um, again, the, this COVID-19 has really shined a light on inequities and disparities. Um, it has also required us to be innovative and to partner 
So in the very beginning of this pandemic, the fact that Democrats and Republicans came together and voted on some things that traditionally they would not be on the same side on, like paid family leave or sick time or um, expansion of unemployment insurance benefits and or even a supplemental check to individuals. This is stuff that uh, historically we might not see ever happen. But we saw it happen. And I think even looking at the results of that um, are, is one of the things that is going to push us, especially as we go into um, this next phase. We today hit the 250,000 mark of deaths in our country. And so, again, many of those frontline workers, many of those individuals who don't have resources are the ones that are hardest hit. I think, again, back to these kind of things that we've done during COVID-19, looking at what can we do to institutionalize them is going to be the movement as we move forward. And I think ultimately that helps the bottom line. I, I just wanted to mention, Jeff mentioned Amazon. I got to go visit one of their programs and I saw people being trained to be phlebotomists. And I'm like, what does that have to do with delivering my package? And, and, and the, the whole point is that when public sector and private sector work together, the fact that they were stepping up, that creates a win-win opportunity for the company because they are also creating a positive work environment that helps with productivity, that helps that in individual raise their standard of living, which helps all of us. And so I think there's that connection between what we can do in terms of setting the environment and creating the investments for that kind of growth, but also what the public private sector can do as well in partnership. Liz, can I just jump in on this? Um, you know, big, what's the role of big companies? Because I know you and I have talked about this before. One of the things that has been missing is really um, industry coming in and uh, lending its weight the way Jeff just described to creating access and opportunity. Up till now, it's been, you know, a big company posts a job description and expects a just-in-time worker to show up perfectly trained. And this notion about, you know, it's not our responsibility, we've got, you know, a just-in-time system here, um, isn't true. And we've been leaning heavily on community colleges and the supply side. But now it's time for the demand side to step up and not just integrate and say what they need, but to take a lifelong training perspective. I like to say, spend as much time on your supply chain of human capital as you do your supply chain of goods and services. I, I totally I totally agree with that. I mean, one of the things that um, David Alter and, and I have worked on, David, you know, obviously one of the leaders of the uh, the report, is that, you know, the economy, the American economy has become increasingly characterized by, you know, very large firms, you know, so, you know, superstar firms like Amazon and like Apple. And, you know, some of these firms have, um, you know, have been very much influenced about the idea that, you know, the only thing is shareholder value. And I'm glad to hear that many net firms are now taking a wider view of this. It's not just about maximizing shareholder value. It should be thinking about the stakeholders in the firm, not just the shareholders. And that includes the workers, the consumers, and the communities that these firms are in. So I think there's a, you know, a, a positive role these large firms can play in terms of helping, um, especially less educated workers, have a, not just a job, but a decent career. And that involves the kind of training interventions, the kind of things that, uh, that, that we've been talking about. So I think that's vitally important going forward. I feel like we're going to go full circle on this question because this, you know, I also don't want to um, negate the issue of equity and race and gender and the challenges that we face. Like this pandemic, we've gone backwards with women in the workforce, which is, is a surprise to me. Many women have had to leave the workforce. When we look at, you know, um, people of color, the I, we, we had some research, we talked to, to LinkedIn, and they were saying that even people who have the same skills and same qualifications have get dis disparate treatment as it pertains to getting jobs. So again, us being very intentional about how we, you know, Joe Biden says build back better. Um, I think we have to be very intentional about that uh, as well, whether it's the upskilling or whether it's the benefits that we provide, um, it, it's gotta be intentional. Well, and particularly uh, with the whole uh, issue of racial justice 
and the real um, you know, racial stri strife we've seen in the country over the last few months, this, it seems to me, we've got uh, potentially, I mean, we've got a whole new lens on this, uh, we hope, you know, uh, by the public, private sector, by the public sector. But what do you hope for, Congresswoman, in terms of taking that agenda forward? Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have right now, I, I, I know people have said, you know, sort of what's the first thing that uh, a Biden-Harris administration should do? What is the area that you should focus on? And I think there is a, a what and a how. Um, I think the what is focusing on opportunity, and, and, and that's that's jobs and that's clean energy jobs and that's using the innovation that we've been talking about. Um, and as we've seen, even through this pandemic, as people have had to get creative about how they work and what products they even produce, that, that job function, which could be building infrastructure, clean energy buildings, creates better health, it, cre it helps our environment, and it can deal with equity issues. The, those are the kind of the what, but the how that I think is our biggest challenge is uniting this country. If we don't unite, if we don't see our common good and our common goals, then it is hard to get rid of this pandemic. It is hard to build back better. And so to me, what gives me hope is conversations like this, what gives me hope, the number of young people who came out and participated. And what gives me hope is a vision that is focused on the future of this country and the now. So I, I, I remain hopeful, um, but I believe unity and, and healing is gonna be the number one order of business. That's very profound, unity and healing. Maybe I'll turn over to Karen um, and your thoughts about how we move forward in terms of unity and healing. And particularly, you know, um, John has done research and others about the role of the private sector, about management and taking the lead on making some of these, uh, what are the, a lot of the things that we're talking about today in terms of policies, whether it's job quality, whether it's innovation, you know, leadership from the private sector is so important. You, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, but I want to jump uh, back to the notion that we're leaving out one whole segment of the jobs of the future, and that's the small business jobs. And if you think about who is uh, employing everybody right now, um, half the people who work in this country own or work for a small business. So I mentioned what big business needs to do, but that's not going to take care of everybody. Uh, you know, Jeff and everybody who's a, a large company should, you know, help their workforce learn. But what about the small businesses? They can't afford that kind of thing. So what do we do for them? And how do we make sure that this is still the land of opportunity for a small business owner to grow and prosper and provide, you know, the American dream for their family? This whole agenda has come into sharp focus in the pandemic because we have 30 million small businesses. And most of them are either sole proprietorships, they are Uber driver, um, your hairdresser, or they are Main Street businesses. And in the jobs of the future, I just want to remind everybody, not all the robots are going to be serving you coffee. There's still going to be Main Street, we hope, and this whole place that we get together and convene, I even contend that's the best part of the jobs of the future. You know, they're going to become more important. So we need a whole series of things that make sure that small business owners have access to ways to train their employees, maybe help by, you know, some broad scale programs, that they have access to health care through the kind of group health care um, ability to purchase that we envision actually in the first uh, Obamacare shop exchanges. We need to bring that back. And we need to make sure we've got access and opportunity for more diverse business owners. We know that there's a gap in access to capital for the smallest business owners, for women-owned businesses, and for minority-owned businesses. And Black businesses just are getting crushed. So how in this next session of Congress do we uh, pass the pandemic relief and then follow it on with some support for access to capital that is distributed not just through banks, but through some of these, you know, um, 
technology companies and fintechs that get money into the hands of the smallest owned businesses. Some, the SBA in this time, in the time I was there had, you know, two X the number of black businesses and um, women owned businesses and other minority owned businesses than regular lending portfolios. We need to make sure we keep the wind at, uh, at the back so that these categories um, have opportunity and access and that's, I think, an equal priority to some of the larger scale things we're doing. Jeff, you obviously have a lot of interaction with the business community, as well as with the, the large tech companies. What's your perspective about business leadership on this agenda that we're discussing now? Well, as I said before, I, we, we, we certainly uh, have uh, built a successful business helping other businesses to succeed. And, actually a series of them, including AWS and our fulfillment business that I talked about and, you know, creative uh, uh, entrepreneurs. I mean, we, we have with Kindle Direct Publishing a way for, you know, people who, uh, who write art to uh, publish it directly and make more money doing so. So uh, that's one way that, uh, that we can help. I, one of the things that I think the, the study uh, does a great job of discussing is some things that we need to do to support Kind of gig work and um, you know less than full time, less you know fully scheduled work. I, that's come up an, a number of times in the conversations today. And you know I can talk about Amazon providing full time and benefits to to all full time employees. You know the healthcare plan, the 401k, the 20 weeks of paid maternity leave. I never liked that senior executives would have like a different benefit plan than the kind of hourly folks. So we built our plans at Amazon to be the same for everybody. I have the same health plan as somebody who starts tomorrow working in a fulfillment center. Um, I have the same number of weeks of, of paid leave. But, but that's what we can do as a big company. Karen made the point that small entrepreneurs and small companies can't necessarily do that. And, and again, the, the report says some, uh, makes some great suggestions about how to make benefits portable, how to think about uh, unemployment insurance that supports people who don't work full time, but who work, you know, a reasonable number of, of hours per week. Um, and then the access to capital, you know, if you're a very large firm, you can borrow uh, capital at almost a 0% interest rate. It, it doesn't make sense to me that the portfolio of small businesses on average has such a high interest rate. Um, you know, that's got to be a role for a government to play, as Karen suggested, you know, to, to make sure more capital gets into the hands of of smaller entrepreneurs. Just, Karen, just to pick up, sorry. sorry go ahead. I was just going to pick up on what uh, you know, what Jeff and Karen both said about um, the importance of uh, small businesses and what you were saying about technology and management. I mean, one of the things that we've learned from looking at the studies of um, how technology spread around the economy. It's not just about coming up with a you know flashy new ideas in robotics and AI that MIT does. It's how you know, those techniques get spread around to small and medium-sized enterprises in other part of the economy. And there's often a thought that, well, all you need to do is spend more money. If you just throw money at the problem, you buy enough expensive uh, computers, that's going to solve the problem. And what we've learned is that will definitely not solve the problem. Really, the difference between making um, a big productivity and performance improvement from using technology or not is how... Um, managers and workers use that technology effectively. You can spend hundreds of millions of dollars and get very little return from that. So we did a big, you know, as part of the workforce, of the, work, the workforce of the future, we looked a lot at healthcare. And, you know, under the Obama administration, there was a good push to use electronic health records and other forms of IT in hospitals. But there was a massive variance in hospitals which did this successfully and did this poorly. And the key thing which differentiated that was not how much they spent, but it was about how that technology's introduction was managed and used in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hospital. So, you know, if you had, you know, um, well-skilled, a well-skilled workforce who managers engage them early on, help them with the introduction of new technologies, you've got very big payoffs, better outcomes clinically and performance wise, if you didn't, you know, you could destroy, you know, millions and millions of dollars of, of, uh, of well-being. So really it's this interaction between technology and the management and skills of the workforce, which are critical to delivering these kind of productivity benefits. And you see that not just in healthcare, but just about every industry we've looked at. Liz, could I add to uh, what uh, Karen's focus on small businesses? Because I think it is, it is critical. I mean, we've seen 
you know, not only have frontline workers been so disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, but small businesses have been disproportionately impacted. And many have gone out of business and not to return without the help and support. And sort of back to the role of, of, of government, you know, we were able to pass the PPP program and the idle loans, but what we saw was again, where did the dollars go? And did they go to those that need them the most? And so I think we have opportunities also as we look at a next package to be very targeted, very specific, and use, as she mentioned, FinTech, um, using CDFIs, the community development, uh, you know, financial institutions to really get the money where it needs to go. Um, I also wanted to mention just rapid response like to this current situation where we know if I'm no longer working in a restaurant, I need, a, I still need a job and I don't have time to get a four year degree. Um, and so us being able to make sure like we did with the CARES dollars in Delaware, they created through Department of Labor and with partnerships of community colleges and others, a real focus on how to rapidly respond based on labor market needs. That's gonna be really pivotal as we talk about building back better is that we can be responsive. And the last thing I would mention is as we talked about the, the social contract, whether it's, you know, now it's a gig economy and do you have uh, a pension? You know, issues like our pension system, issues like our healthcare system as was mentioned, but also childcare. That's a major support, child and family care for that matter, because we have an aging population. If we want to support our workers, our businesses, our communities, and our country, we need to look at that social contract and have it be portable, have it be universal, and, and, and make sure that it's equitable as well. I will say, Congresswoman, you will agree that there's a lot of distrust right now in, uh, in our institutions, certainly potentially in our federal government. Um, you know, how do we tackle some of the bold ideas and bold legislation you're talking about? Do you see a path forward on, on how to do that? I, I kind of loop back to what I was saying too about the healing of this nation and how important that is. And it's, it's, it's funny, just yesterday I was on the House floor, I introduced a, a bill with my Republican colleague, um, Tim Wahlberg, focused on scams of seniors because of COVID. Well, the bill was then wrapped around, it became five bills together that were all bipartisan that passed the House. People don't hear those stories that often. And those are the stories that give people hope when they know that we actually are working on things together, even after a major election or during the process of, <laughs> for some. Um, it is still, we are still working together. And I think that this moment presents that opportunity to reinstate that trust. Um, and that's, again, why I say for, you know, I think Joe Biden, the reason why, at least from day one, I came out for him was because I felt that he was a person who could unite us from Harlem to the heartland. And I think that that's what we need right now. And we have to model that. And I think by doing infrastructure, for example, it's not just roads and bridges, that is broadband and internet. That is the connectivity that we're gonna need in this current and future economy. And so I think it creates jobs, it creates uh, creates possibilities, but it also creates trust and, and that's what we need. So I keep spreading the word about the work that we do do together in a bipartisan manner, because I want people to know, and anybody who saw me four years ago, I came in smiling, I'm still smiling, I still have hope. That's great to hear. Karen, you have been in a position where you've been you know, leading an agency and trying to get things done and working certainly across the aisle. Any thoughts from your, your side about how we actually do get some of these important uh, ideas uh, forward and legislation passed? Unmute. Uh, we are not lacking for innovative ideas. You know, we've got so many initiatives and you've cataloged a lot of them in the brilliant work on this task force. I think we are lacking a national vision and, and um, Congresswoman, I think you have it exactly right. And I would call um, on all of us to think about this as investments in the American people. You know, we talk about building infrastructure and all these other things. What about investing in the American people? 
And that includes access and opportunity. That includes a lot of people who were mad, you know, in this last election and feel that nobody cares about them. So how do we create a national agenda to invest in the American people, to bring them opportunity, to bring them skills, but also just to bring them access to, you know, what we used to stand for, the American dream, the ability to um, have an opportunity to make something yourself on the path that you decide. And how to do that, I think we have to have a national story about this. We have to have some uh, idea that this is a bipartisan, this is what we believe in. And then we have to have, you know, government and business working together with philanthropy, with innovation, with education and universities to chart out some of these big initiatives. One I think is definitely around skills and access and opportunity. I of course think one is around small business and entrepreneurship because that is a source of the American um, creativity and innovation, not just on Main Street, but that's how we get these great ideas from MIT you know, into the commercial usage. It's through this small number of high growth entrepreneurs, but we have to open those doors to more people, women and minority owned businesses. Venture capital doesn't have enough of these people. They don't get access um, to the best entrepreneurs, the full range of entrepreneurs, because we are not as diverse as we want. So I would make a proposal that we invest in the American people and that be our mission. That sounds like some good advice to uh, to President-elect Biden. Uh, maybe we'll go best. around. <laughs> um, let's go around and and maybe get some ideas as well for uh, the Biden administration. What you might prioritize as policies that that they should consider taking forward. And and I think Karen, you would speak to the fact that it's those first hundred days that are really essential to to get the wheels in motion. Um, and Jeff, from your perspective, you've spoken broadly about what you think not only what Amazon's doing, but of course, as Daron Asimoglu said earlier, you know, this is a holistic approach. It's not just what the company envisions, but it's also, you know, a company within society. So what are some of your thoughts about the priorities going forward for the next administration? Well, uh, just a couple of things come to mind. I, I love the, the focus on uh, infrastructure, specifically access to, to um, high bandwidth uh, broadband that uh, the representative Rochester mentioned. Uh, I think that's huge. Um, I would come back first to computer science education. The, the comment I made before, we very quickly with not that much money uh, in the grand scheme of the federal uh, uh, budget, we could make sure that every public high school, especially the public high schools that have uh, the, the, uh, the, the most, um, that are in the areas that need the most support, uh, has a, a computer science uh, teacher and and real computer science courses. It's just not that expensive, and it can be done in less than a year. And then I think that the administration, the new administration, should should continue to support invention and investment by the private sector. We we can't just stay still. We have to remember that in this labor market, the rest of the world, in this market for ideas, the rest of the world is advancing too, and we have to support R and D. We have to support uh, invention by private companies. And, um, and make sure that that uh, invention is in a broad cross-section of, of technologies across, um, across the economy. Uh, John, from across the pond, you've been in you know, multiple places to think about policy and, and agendas going forward. What's your uh, priorities for a Biden administration? Um, you know, resonating very much with what people have said in the Congress. You know, we have to think of bipartisan things, which I think we can do in this space where, you know, there's there's no uh, ideological view that somehow the private sector is always better or the government's always better. We're better when we work these things together, as we've seen in the development of vaccines for COVID, for example. That's a wonderful example of you know a combination of you know both governments and and, and the private sector. Uh, so I would you know, re you know certainly we have to think about raising the minimum wage. We have to think about education through community colleges. We have to think about giving people skills. But I would, you know, I, the vision, that my vision, my hope, maybe op overly optimistic, is to do something, you know, radical on the innovation front. The, you know, the, the US spends a third of um, the level of, you know, in the mid 1960s, the amount of um, R&D federal funding for GDP was three times what it is today. 
So, it, so you know, we've really effectively cut back massively on basic um, fun, funding for basic science, basic research, things which have very high spillovers for the rest of society. So we, I really would like a kind of a grand innovation challenge to deal with the big uh, innovation deficits that we have around climate change, uh, around um, a, a health, around defense. And I would do that in such a way that the beneficiaries of that are not just, you know, the coastal elites of MIT and Stanford, but really get into the heartlands. And I think you could do that. You could have competitions to create technology hubs all over the United States and many of these areas which feel left behind. And that way you would both create the growth that we need and also you'd help level up the kind of uh, places which feel as if they are not sharing in the benefits for the rest of uh, the rest of uh, the country. That's great. I've been weaving in a number of questions we've gotten from the audience, but I've got one I think that is a great one for us to end on. And the question came in, experimentation, iteration, and failing fast are part of the current philosophy of American tech. Uh, is there a way that, or, or should government be adopting a similar uh, philosophy? And if so, how might we do that? Um, Congresswoman, thoughts about how we make uh, government- I knew you were going to come to me first on this one. <laughs> okay, thoughts uh, about- <laughs> yeah, ways to make government more responsive and, um, and, and potentially effective. Yeah, you know, I, I, because again, I ran for office and got elected in my 50s, I had a different life experience before, before coming here. And, um, and I totally um, support that concept of, of, of iteration and moving forward faster. And I guess I really do want to kind of couple that with what John was just saying about the innovation and R&D. Um, right before I took this job, I actually lived in China and I had heard, you know, that there was the, the goal that they were going to match us in artificial intelligence, I think by 2020 and surpass us by 2025. Um, this question is truly about our competitiveness, our health, our, 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 our safety. It is connected to everything that, that we do. And so, to me, um, yeah, I like the idea of, of doing that, but I also know the body that I'm a part of, 435 on this side and 100 on the other side, and a president and a Supreme Court. And I think that there are things that we can do by giving money to local governments, which is why the HEROES Act is so important because we can do things on a, on a local level and get results and feed that back to transform the system. And the same is true with our universities and our colleges, as well as the private sector. So I think if we can get that money in R&D and investments and innovation out to where it needs to be, then that can be the, the, the change agent. And I think our vac vaccine um, situation right now is a perfect example of that. With Operation Warp Speed, we have been able to have multiple players participate from the private sector with support from the federal government to create what we hope to be a vaccine that will save lives. I think we have examples of it. We just need to be more, again, back to my word, intentional, intentional about it. Great. Um, another 30 seconds or a little bit more for Karen and Jeff on this question of You've both been on uh, this question of experimentation, iteration, piloting ideas. Is that a model for us to take some of our best ideas forward and, and get something to happen in the next the next administration? Well, it certainly is, you know, a watchword of how we be behave in America. And I agree with the Congresswoman that states and local governments have a better time innovating than the federal government. Um, but even within the federal government, it is possible. And I think part of it is just to look under the hood. And there's a lot of capacity in the federal government. What it takes, I like your word about being intentional, what it takes is a mission, a demand like the virus put upon us um, and a collective will to decide we are going to move in a certain direction. And then we do have the imagination and the innovation uh, within us to be able to go forward even in the federal government. Jeff, your thoughts? Well, I, I think that's I think Karen said it really well. Um, uh, there are certainly lots of innovation at the state and local level, and um, there are lots of things that the federal government can do. Certainly, intentional work to uh, 
to take advantage of new technologies at the federal level can yield uh, both productivity and enhanced quality of service that's provided. Um, you know, our job as a private company is to do the best that we can for customers, to treat employees really well, and to be an upstanding citizen. And I think if, if firms do that and we focus on unity and progress, uh, we've got a lot to be optimistic about. Well, those are great words to close this panel on. Thank you to all of you, and thank you to our audience as well. It's been a wonderful uh, panel and a wonderful uh, session and discussion for uh, this afternoon. Af Good afternoon. We'll see you. We'll see you in the next thank section. You. Thank you all. Thank you.